Now, this is a compilation of all of the studies done since 2011. And why since 2011? As I'll show you in a moment, because that's when the World Health Organization first said cell phone radiation is a possible human carcinogen, right? Possible. If you use a phone for 1,640 hours, your risk of brain cancer is increased in all of the studies. These, each one of these is a study on the top. Interphone, Hardell, and Serenot, which is the French study I just showed you, is the Serenot study. And note with the asterisk that children that began using phones have much higher risk than those who started to use phones as adults. And in the Swedish study, after 20 years of use, children have four to eight times more glioma. And this is, a, again, a dreadful cancer. Now, it's argued that there's no increase in cancer, and that's true. These are the data. This is for all age groups in the United States. If you take all the ages together, there's no increase. That's what, that's what this is showing you. There is no increase in brain cancer, right? However, if you look at the age-specific rates, which is the, in the groups that are most relevant, namely the 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and 40 to 49, you see a significant annual increase in young people in a very rare, highly malignant cancer. So we've been asking the wrong question because the majority of brain cancers occur in people in their 60s, in their 60s. How many of the people that you know of are in their 60s with brain cancer? How old are they in their 30s, 40s, 40s? How old is your, 40? 75, okay. But the 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, those are the people who are very unusual because the average age of diagnosis for this cancer is uh, 62, right? So something's happening to increase brain cancer in young people, and we believe this is one of the factors. Now, there's a lot of experimental work on this, and as I told you in the beginning, when we, ha we test animals to make drugs, but if we have the animal data when it comes to predicting harm to humans, we question it, and we wait for proof of human harm. There's been a well-organized campaign to manufacture doubt so that when the National Toxicology Program released its significant increases in rare malignant tumors of the heart and brain, namely glioma, the same cancer that I just showed you is increased in people, the industry went all out to attack the National Toxicology Program. They had people say, this is not peer-reviewed. That's nonsense. If this is peer-reviewed, it's extensively reviewed before it gets out both for statistics and pathology with blinded reviews, meaning you have a group of statisticians and a group of pathologists sitting around a room and a table looking at the actual data, and it says agent A, B, C. They don't know which one is the control, they don't know which one is exposed, and they then score it. And this is done in triple blinded fashion. And then it gets released, and then it gets reviewed, and now it comes out for a final peer review. Do you understand how reviewed this, these data are? And the nonsense to say this is not a reviewed study, I mean, that's, that's just a lie. But we live in a world where alternative facts are often bandied about and where science itself is suffering as a result. Animal studies are used in clinical trials to develop or test drugs at NIEH and elsewhere. So the National Toxicology Program spends $25 million and they have a company build their test facility that works with Motorola and all the others. So the whole program, if anything, is biased toward a finding of no effect, okay? But they found something. They found that animals exposed in their two-year lifetime to the same levels of radiation that you might get in your lifetime developed these rare malignant tumors of the brain and heart. And the, what makes this really remarkable is that there have been many other studies predicting exactly this. This is simply the largest and most recent study to have these findings. And this is what they found. You can see there, there's the glioma on the left, and there's what's called a schwannoma on the right. And these are rare 
cancers. But in addition to these rare cancers, there were precancerous conditions called hyperplasias of the brain and heart. And these cardiac hyperplasias of the heart were very rare and also very, it definitely increased. They also used both two different types of cell phone radiation, all common radiation for the phones that are you currently carrying right now. Now, you have to understand that there are synergistic effects. Those membranes that I showed you that were disintegrating of the testis, once the membrane starts to weaken, then any toxic agent in your body can be absorbed more deeply into the body. And there have been a number of in vivo and in vitro studies, that's studies in whole animals, that show exactly this kind of synergy, where they've taken uh, animals and produced the same sort of uh, result in the animals that we're talking about here. This is one of them. They prenatally exposed animals to a known liver carcinogen, okay? And this is the control. It's called a positive control. There, you see the black thing there? That's exposed only to the carcinogen. We know it's gonna cause cancer. It's been well established. It's used in laboratory studies to cause cancer. But look at how much more cancer is caused when you add that carcinogen to weak, weak amounts of wireless radiation, like you might get from a router or a tower, weaker than what you would get from your phone. And interestingly, with the weaker exposure, you get a very strong response, as you do from the stronger exposure. And this study was done by a man who previously said, there's no problem, which makes it all the more interesting. Korea is very concerned about technology addiction, and they even mentioned it at the opening of the Olympics. They have programs to treat people who are addicted to the internet. But they've also found that children who have just a little bit of lead more in their brains than others have even more of a biological response, again suggesting the synergy between exposure to toxic things and the response at the cellular level. Now the good news is sleep in the dark. Melatonin protects against some of this damage in animals. And this study that I'm showing you here, there have been a number of others that have replicated it. Again, over there, this uh, on the far column, that is hydrogen peroxide. And that is a positive control. We know it, it's going to be causing free radicals. It's gonna be damaging. But here you see what happens. If you have uh, controls, that's the not exposed, or melatonin exposure, you don't get as much damage. This is a measure of reactive oxygen species. But if you have the exposure combined, which you have there, of RF radiation by itself, look what happens, and hydrogen peroxide by itself. But if you have RF radiation with melatonin, you get almost a normal response. Not quite. That's why unplug your bedrooms and try to unplug before you go to sleep. Cell phone radiation, as I just showed you there, increases damaging reactive oxygen species, free radicals, right? That's what the vitamin C is supposed to get rid of. We find this in 70-day-old male rats. That's like a middle-aged man. It also affects the hearing. This is very important. As we get older, all of us are concerned about our hearing. And we should be. We're, we're really living in a world where noise has become accepted. Uh, and we really need to rethink what it, what it means to be able to be in a quiet space. So the effects of electromagnetic waves on the auditory system have been demonstrated. And you can see, this is a study of the cochlear nucleus. And you can see effects on exposed nerves. And that's important because that's the nerve that gets the most exposure. And this one is in the brain now, showing that when you expose animals prenatally, you will get effects on the hippocampus, which is essential to balance and critical thinking and impulse control. And look at the control cells. They're nice, rounded little cells. That's what cells are supposed to look like, nice. And look on the exposed. They're disintegrated. Prenatally exposed newborns if they've been exposed as newborns, 
they take three times as long to find their way out of an experimental maze. Okay? That's a pretty profound result. And look at the difference in the control and the EMF exposed group in how long it took them to learn the task. It took them longer to learn the task, and they made more mistakes. Think about that the next time you're on your phone and driving. Now, we are working with grassroots environmental organization to promote the Baby Safe Project, and so far we have over 200 doctors who have signed a statement. One of our leaders is Hugh Taylor, who is chief of obstetrics at Yale, who is deeply concerned, and they are handing out these tips for pregnant women, because, of course, at the end of pregnancy, the skeleton is right at the surface, the backbone is right at the surface uh, for the pregnant mother as anyone who's had a baby knows, and your exposure can be very high to the nervous system at that time. Now, we know in animals that, because we can get four generations of rats in less than a year, basically, because they breed every three weeks. This is a study that showed that if you expose the animals to this kind of radiation, you can actually measure their hormone levels, and you can show that they are half or less of normal if they've been exposed over generations to Wi-Fi radiation. It, this is a very, very important finding because it's showing intergenerational transmission of an effect. And I'm afraid that we are seeing that now with a lot of our unexplained problems with young children today. Now, listen to the plants and lower animals because I was astonished to see how much literature there is on the effects on plants. Machine learning and big data is the, are the new buzzwords, and this brilliant woman in Melbourne, Australia, uh, did a peer-reviewed study recently where she took all the studies she could find on plants and Wi-Fi, and there were quite a few in good journals, and she scrubbed them through a machine learning program that basically lets the computer tell you what you learn. And what she saw in this very sophisticated analysis was that Wi-Fi radiation affects the microscopic hairs on the plant root. It affects nitrogen uptake called nitrification. It affects the stems and the roots and the leaves and the growing pattern. And you know how when you take a plant out of a root pot that you get from the nursery, it's all, the, the, you see all of the roots at the bottom? Well, when you put a plant like that close to a router, the roots on the bottom look like they're trying to run away. They're not there. And it's really a very powerful vis visible indication of what's going on. Uh, Saludin et al. did an, another study on something very fascinating. And I don't know now, I need to learn more about bees on what type of bee, but I believe these were honeybees because that's the thing that people seem to be most animated about. And here's what they did. They did 10 minutes of cell phone radiation daily for 10 days. Now, bees are very complicated animals, and they have worker bees, and they have um, bees that the only job is to take care of the queen, and they have certain dances that they do, and you can tell things about the bees by how they dance and how they move around, etc. 10 minutes of cell phone radiation daily for 10 days. There were three hives that were exposed, and there were three hives that were controls. And you, guess what? After that exposure, the majority of the bees didn't come back. The workers gave up. The, bee, the, the, the queen doesn't move. She stays there and dies when she's ready and to make an, a new one. But that was a pretty important piece of work. Now, why do we have so many inconsistent results? That's a good question. A very good question. Because I'm showing you positive results, right? But I have to tell you, there are negative results, right? Well, take a look at this. This was developed by my colleague, Henry Lai. And he showed that if you look at studies by who pays for them, in terms of finding a harmful effect, those studies done that have no industry funding, you know, three out of four of them tend to find an effect. But the studies funded by industry, which, by the way, is the majority of work done in this field, of course, those tend to show no effect. And by the way, Motorola has shut down its research lab in this field. So there's, industry itself is not funding research in this field. 
There are very talented researchers in the private sector that would love to do more work on these kinds of questions, and they don't have resources because there's no reason, there's no interest in finding out the answers to these questions of what's going on. We now have in the United States a serious legal effort regarding the right to know about cell phone radiation, which I believe is fundamental to a democracy. Berkeley passed a new law requiring retailers to post factual information, and the former Solicitor General of the United States was hired by the telecom industry, Theodore Olson, to argue their case. Um, he gets paid thousands of dollars a day, thousands of dollars a day. Our case was argued by Lawrence Les Lessig, who is a Harvard constitutional law professor, pro bono, meaning he and his law students and colleagues did it for free. And so far, we've won. So far, the court has upheld the right of Berkeley to require you to post a notice that if you carry your phone in a pants or shirt pocket or tucked into a bra, when the phone is on, you may exceed the federal guidelines for exposure to RF radiation. They said you couldn't say the risk is greater for children at that time, but in fact, I, th I think it is. That judge sitting like this looking bored, the woman, her husband is one of the big investors in 5G. And she, was a, she did not recuse herself from this case. Now, the California Department of Public Health has, in fact, issued guidelines, finally. They first developed these guidelines when I was directing the Center for Environmental Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, and they based it on our guidelines and referenced what we had done in Pittsburgh. They did. That was their first and second and third draft. But by the time they got to their 27th draft, that advice was missing. I'm not going to go into details here because all of that information is available on cards that I uh, will offer to you. If you are interested in sharing information about this with other people, hold up your hands and we have cards to give you. And if you want multiple cards, then you have to agree to send an email to info at ehtrust.org and tell us what you're doing with the cards. That's the only condition. Just tell us what you're doing. So um, we have cards to give out, and if you want multiple cards, ask for them, but I'm asking you as a matter of trust to send an email to info at the address on these cards. Mm -hmm.